Welcome to the creative session. We will get started in a few minutes. We're glad you're here. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat area. We will send a replay recording of the session in a few days. everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to have you here and to get to talk with our expert Paul Wilson on the toolkit for e-learning uh, instructional design. Now my name is Caroline Hoy and I am the marketing manager here at Well Said Labs. So before we get started today, I just want to go through what we're going to be talking about. Uh, first, we're going to have an introduction from Paul telling us a little bit about his work and how he got started. After that, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the common issues that face anyone working in the e-learning de instructional design industry. And then we're going to get to Paul's favorite tools for every step of the process, including an example of some of his finished work and how he used those tools. Uh, now, I will say that there was a little recording glitch in the first part of the webinar, so we're going to skip a little bit of the intro here, but don't worry, we caught the whole recording of all of Paul's best tips and tricks, as well as a Q&A at the end with some really interesting uh, information about real life situations in e-learning design. So welcome again. Thank you for joining us. And uh, if you haven't seen Paul before, he's all over YouTube. He has over 20,000 followers in instructional design. And he has a station where he reviews all kinds of different products, processes, and also teaches about how to use Adobe Captivate because he is an Adobe community professional. So let's jump right in and learn about instructional design toolkit from Paul Wilson. Thank you. Getting started. This meeting is being you, recorded. Oh, sorry about that. I'm no not sure problem. if I at the beginning there. Hopefully that's still recording. Um, yeah, so if you're in a situation where, you know, maybe you're just getting started or maybe you are like me when I started, you know, and I had no budget from the company I worked for, uh, you know, you have to look for free alternatives that are, that are out there. So it's a balancing act. I'd rather have the best product possible, but obviously price is, is always going to be a factor to a certain degree. But don't be afraid of incurring those expenses because you are a self-employed freelancer like I am. 
you can pass those expenses on to your client. Just make sure you consider that before you lowball a quote to them. You know, consider what your expenses are. Mm. And when you were an in-house designer, uh, you talked about needing to kind of prove an ROI to get that budget approved. Do you have any tips on how to make a case for some of these tools? I've, um, yeah, the, the last uh, example that I can think of when I was working for, um, actually for the Greater Toronto Airports Authority, um, it was a case where I wanted to add some engagement into our e-learning. They were starting to become page turners. And for those that are familiar with instructional design, specifically with e-learning, you know, like level one e-learning, you know, basically a PowerPoint. And we wanted to bump up the level a bit. One of the first tools that, uh, that I convinced management to pay for was a license with, I believe it was called Video Scribe at the time. I think it's been renamed since then. But it was one of these pencil hand drawing video creation tools that was just a neat way to make the, uh, you know, the information that we were conveying pop on the screen. Uh, they're probably a little passe now. This was going back about eight years ago when it was pretty cutting edge. But really what, it, what I did was I managed to get my hands on the trial version of that and you know, prepare a sample for management to look at. They came to me, of course, and said, Paul, we want you to do something more, something interesting. Make it pop, I think were, were the words that they said. <laughs> So I prepared a, a demo for them. And, you know, you take it to the powers that be. Don't be afraid to ask for the tools that you need. Uh, you know, and, and this was a case where once they saw, you know, this hand coming in and drawing a sketch of, of what the narrator was conveying in the training, they're like, oh, we got to have that. I think we, we need that. How much is that? And it wasn't expensive. I don't know. I think it might have been $50 a month or something like that. It would be expensive for me to take that out of my pocket, but not for a, you know, a large corporation. So uh, usually if you can get your hands on the trial edition, reach out to the sales department of these tools and ask and see if they can partner with you and prepare something that you can show management and you know, convince them, oh yeah, we need this for sure. So kind of showing that wow factor and then that makes Absolutely. the ask a little easier. Wonderful. Yeah. I like that. Um, before we get into this example, I'm curious too about where, how do you find out about new tools and what you're going to try for different needs that you have? I think the best source has been for me to always just sort of participate in the communities that you're mm -hmm. a part of. Like with, uh, with myself, of course, the Adobe community is really strong. They have, uh, they have several community pages where users can talk with other users, ask questions. Other people can give solutions to those challenges or problems. Um, and you know, if you have the means, uh, definitely participate in some of the conferences that are out there. I know that myself, I was basically unknown when I went freelance because I had worked for exactly uh, three different organizations as an e-learning designer developer. So in the world of e-learning designer developers, nobody knew who I was. But obviously the YouTube channel had an impact. But when I started going to conferences and meeting people and building connections, you end up with this network of colleagues that you can rely on. And it, it's, you know, there's, there's some great other non-official tools that you can take advantage of to access those networks as well. You, you don't have to go to a big expensive conference. Um, you know, just the, like for example, the Adobe Captivate um, community has a Facebook page that's quite mm -hmm. prolific. There's tons of people there. And every day people are asking questions. I try to jump in and answer as many of those as I can. Cause of course, when I got started, there was no Facebook. For, for Adobe <laughs> Captivate. So I had to figure out a lot of this stuff on my own, but it's great to have that resource. But, you know, I'm not a bottomless well either. I, I ask questions too, and I'm looking for alternative tools and ideas and, 
you know, people are just uh, really great with sharing, of course, it's fantastic. Yeah, those Facebook groups are really becoming a rich source of information. Um, you know, we find all kinds of, me as a marketer, there's a lot of great marketing groups. There's ones for, you know, voice actors and literally any specialty you can think of. It's not just social anymore. Uh, there's a lot of great professional information on there. Do you use um, any of like the software review sites as a resource? Um, I've actually been engaged by, is it Captera, I believe mm -hmm. is the name right off the top mm -hmm. of my head. I'm, I've, I've actually been engaged and I've, I've done a review of Adobe Captivate and several other uh, software solutions. And I've certainly looked to see what uh, what other people are talking about there as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've definitely done, I've been reached out to by them a number of times. Um, and I know I've done a couple of reviews for them, uh, which were a lot of fun to record because of course they're on your cell phone. So you have to prop up your cell phone and, and uh, answer their questions that they have for you. But it's also a great resource too, you know, Obviously, we have the World Wide Web, you know, Google search and all this sort of thing, just to type in what you're looking for, and you never know where you're going to end up. But quite often, there's some really cool ideas out there. I know some of the tools that I use today, I didn't know about until I, you know, reached out to different communities. Uh, Camtasia is a good example of that. I didn't know anything about the software when I first started using it. Uh, but very quickly realized that, you know, it was the tool that I needed as well. Hmm. That's great when we can uh, have trusted people that you know are trying to do the same thing you are and yeah. <laughs> have tried different things and you can get that information sort of without reinventing the wheel every time. Yeah. Oh, for sure. You can't work in a silo. You've got to rely on other people and their experiences, of course. Great. Okay, well, bear with me here. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to watch this example of an e-learning module that you've built. And then we're just going to talk through sort of how you built each stage of this. So here is one. Can you tell us just a little maybe about the project and how you planned it before we start playing? Well, the, the hard part about sharing e-learning um, both here and when, when I speak at conferences is that you know when I design e-learning for my my end users, my clients, um, you know it's proprietary. So uh, I can't always share the work that I've done for the various corporations or clients that I've done. So I built this as sort of a proof of concept. You know I wanted to showcase some of the interactions that were uh, that I was going to be teaching at conferences and things like that when I was. Uh, doing my teaching part of my job. So I built this as, you know, just sort of a, a demo that, um, you know, I could share with people and then show them the steps on how to build it. You can go ahead and hit the play button there, Carolyn. So the, the first stage, are we hearing audio or no? Uh, I don't hear anything. Let me... I remember when you first sent it to me, I did hear it. So let me see if this. Yeah, it's okay if there's no audio. Okay. Yeah, there's a voiceover, which would be nice considering it's, I believe, one of our voices. It is um, a yeah. So that was that was part of what I was going to talk about. But we don't need to hear it to know that it's uh, that it's fantastic, of course. Um, <laughs> so when I design, the first thing I do. I sort of follow the ADDIE model. And if for those that are, are instructional designers will pr probably recognize it. It's an acronym for uh, analysis, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And so during the analysis stage, I'm thinking about, okay, what do I wanna train? What is the scope of the project? What is the information that I, you know, I wish to, to share with my learners? What do they need to know to do their job? Um, you know, in this case here, it's an anti-discrimination uh, e-learning course. So I'm just talking about, you know, if something happens to you, what, what are some of the steps that you should take? Um, I've designed this to just have kind of a, this cartoon character. I didn't really want to use real people. I really like sort of this flat matte kind of look to, to everything. 
And, you know, at the storyboard stage, when I'm just at the, the, the beginning of the design process, I do a, a sketch of what I think I want to do. And then, of course, at the, de at the development stage, that's when I go over to Captivate and I start um, adding my images, uh, creating the shapes, adding the text. And, uh, and then, of course, once I have a script, I take it over to Well Said Labs. I do usually a slide at a time. It's usually only about three minutes worth of audio per slide or less. And, uh, and I render that and it's fantastic the quality that you get from Well Said Labs. Not only have I used it in this demo project, um, you know, I'm a big believer in if I'm gonna endorse something, it's gonna be something I actually use. And Well Said Labs is a tool that I actually use. So yes, I, I, I endorse the product, but it's because I believe in it and I've used it myself. My last client, I used Well Said for an entire 30 or 40 minute um, uh, e-learning course for them. And originally, it's kind of funny, that originally they said, oh no, we don't want any text to speech. If you could record your own voice, because you know I do have that radio voice that I could take advantage <laughs> of, but I, I didn't. I, I, I actually used the Well Said Voices as a temporary audio track for their project. And they were so happy with it. They said, no, no, we don't need to re-record it. I love those voices. They sound great. They sound like a real person. So the, the result was that's what I went with. And when I do demo projects like that, this is totally what I, what I use as well. But great. if I you hit continue here, you can see maybe a, just a little bit more of this sample project here. OK, I figured out the sound. So I think we should be able to hear it here. Sometimes people are unaware that their comments or actions have been hurtful. It's important to address discrimination or harassment when it occurs. Bringing your concerns to the attention of people who have offended you is usually enough to stop the offending behavior. It's not uncommon to have some apprehension about speaking with someone who has hurt you. Here is a simple four-step process to help make it easier. Click on each step to learn more. Once you've reviewed all the steps, you can continue with the course. So I'm a big believer in making your e-learning interactive. Um, a click to reveal is very simple. Like if, if Carolyn, if you click step one, for example. Describe the behavior. Be specific and tell the person exactly what it was that offended you. This is an important first step and will help the person understand the problem. So, you know, uh, we don't have to click on the rest, but the idea being that the learner would click on each one of these very simply stated steps and they would learn more about each step. And it's a great way to chunk out the information rather than having too much text on the screen. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, another example of a well said voice there, uh, there's a lot of people, if I don't tell them ahead of time that I'm using uh, I guess AI voice would be the better term to use in this case. Um, most people don't know. I've seen videos on YouTube where I recognize the well said uh, voices and, you know, it just sounds like someone's narrating. It's really fantastic. And uh, yeah, that, I mean, I mean, it's just a matter of building these interactions out. Uh, the voices I used here, I used a variety of voices. I know someone in the chat was just asking which voices they were. I'm sorry, off the top of my head, I don't remember uh, what it was. That female voice though, actually, I, it reminds me, I used her uh, because she reminded me of one of my elementary school teachers. You know, <laughs> a, a little bit more stern, maybe, uh, you know, a little bit older sounding. Uh, it's interesting that you can hear age in, in voice. And that was the impression I got with that voice. So experience, knowledge, you know, things that you hope for. Yeah, that is interesting. And that's something we think about a lot when we develop new voices is having a range, you know, not only of different types of accents, but also voice characteristics that indicate, you know, a more mature voice or a more youthful voice. And uh, definitely there are different use cases where one of those might work better than the other. I hear the Express teacher now. Your feelings using I statements. Don't just say the behavior was wrong. Tell them how it made you feel. 
Use I statements to help your coworker mm -hmm. understand how their actions or comments impacted you. Love it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so we've talked through, you know, you use Captivate, you use the voices uh, from Well Said Labs as your voice over here. What are some instances or recommendations when those tools maybe aren't in the budget or are there examples when you wouldn't want to use an AI voice? Well, I, I personally feel um, so, you know, I mean, Well Said is a fantastic solution. I think if, if you're not capable of uh, including that in the budget for your e-learning, because it is, it, it's a more of a, it is a more expensive solution than, than many other options that are out there. Um, but, you know, just to give you a little bit of a thought process here, you know, sometimes it's a hardware solution. So uh, again, I have the type of voice that lends itself well to narration. So if it's straight up narration, I can often record that myself. Um, you know, I've bought some equipment here. I have a Blue Yeti microphone, which um, maybe is about $150 at the most. And the various accessories to mount it in this environment. This is just a home office. There's nothing special here. Um, you know, back in the day, if you wanted to record audio, uh, you know, you'd have to go into a recording studio and that's very expensive, of course. But, uh, you know, I've purchased equipment uh, that allows me to do my YouTube videos, things like this right here. Um, you know, and once that expense is done, it's mine to have. So I don't need to worry about ongoing expenses associated with that. I've also hired voice talent in the past. Uh, I did a project um, last year, or maybe it's the year before now, where I just found someone on Fiverr. I spent a lot more than five bucks, but I used Fiverr, Fiverr, Fiverr. <laughs> I used Fiverr <laughs> to find them. And she was great. She would send me the recordings when I was done uh, or when she was done and a uh, couple of pronunciation issues. Um, and then of course I sent those back and she did them no extra charge. So, you know, for that one project, it was about a 30 minute e-learning course uh, the audio narration was probably less than 300, maybe, uh, somewhere in that range anyway. So, I mean, that's a good alternative, especially if you don't have an ongoing need. Like myself, I'm a freelance e-learning designer developer, but I'm a YouTuber, but I'm also a teacher and a public speaker. So all my time isn't spent just making e-learning. So I might go many months without doing that. So that might be a good choice for me in that situation. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, when you have access to a tool like Well Said, it's so efficient and so quick to take a whole script. You don't have to think about hiring a voice actor. Uh, I can do it myself, but I can only do, let's say, a male voice. I can't do a female voice as much as I try. But, uh, you know, if you need a conversation between two characters in an e-learning course, uh, you know, and of course, right now, the, the hot topic in e-learning is using storytelling techniques. So you want to be able to have characters interacting with one another. So that's one of the great advantages of well said or hiring people and going into a recording studio and doing that as well. Some of the, um, the other tools that are available, they're not quite as good. The, the text-to-speech that's built into Captivate, uh, it's very old-fashioned by today's standards. It's called NeoSpeech. I think the company doesn't even exist anymore. It was absorbed mm -hmm. by a company called ReadSpeaker. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's definitely alternatives out there uh, for, for much of the tools that I use. Adobe Captivate's a great tool. Sometimes I've used Articulate Rise. I know I'm the Captivate teacher, but you know, if my client wants it in a particular format, I obviously have to go with the customer in that case there. Yeah, I suppose but, that could be the case with voice as well, where they want a true. specific yeah. Yeah, branded voice or something. Yeah. Um, I am not fully getting into the Q&A period here, but I did see a couple questions on these tools that I wanted to ask you real quick. Um, 
What is your opinion on Captivate versus Storyline? Oh, that's a classic Mac versus PC question. <laughs> okay, I'm getting into um, the nitty gritty of e-learning now. Yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of what I equate it to. I think, uh, you know, I here's what I'll say about that. Uh, in 2005, I guess it was, I was given Adobe Captivate to use. Had I been given, it didn't exist then, but had I been given an Articulate Storyline, I might be teaching people how to do Articulate Storyline today. Um, I think a lot of times the reason people are fans of, of one e-learning authoring tool versus the other um, is because that's what was given to you. Uh, Articulate Storyline is, um, is a great tool for sure. There are some limitations. It's not available for the Mac unless you run it on Parallels. Um, and uh, some of the more advanced interactions that I'm capable of building, uh, you know, it may not be available to you in Storyline. But a lot of people like Storyline. It's a lot like PowerPoint. It's a very simple interface, um, you know, and, and it's a very powerful tool as well. So. I try not to say one is better than the other because of course I'll be accused of being a Captivate fan. Um, but, but the truth is, I think it, it has a lot to do with whatever tool you started with. And of course, because a lot of times we work in the corporate environment, which software we use isn't a choice that's uh, given to us. It's someone else is making that choice for us. You kind of have to live with what you get, so. <laughs> That makes sense. Um, so before we get into our Q&A, and again, feel free to enter those in the bottom here, I wonder if you have any thoughts about sort of the future of e-learning tools. Like how do you see your work changing as the audience changes? Maybe we spend more time at home or less time at home. Um, and maybe we're seeing a bit more tech savvy people receiving the material that you're producing. You have any thoughts on sort of the future of these tools? Well, I think um, a few things are going to happen in the, the coming months and years is that I think there's going to be a lot more e-learning, just the very nature of working from home and uh, distance learning and things like that. I mean, the fact is we're not all gathered in one corporate high rise building anymore. We're, you know, working here, working there, wherever we might be. Uh, so the demand, and I saw this myself about a year ago, when the demand, uh, not necessarily for e-learning developed by me, but uh, people wanting to learn Adobe Captivate, um, that kind of went uh, out of the, uh, uh, you know, just kind of went uh, uh, crazy for me for a while there. I couldn't keep up really with the demand for people wanting to learn Adobe Captivate. So. Uh, clearly, someone was telling them at their, their offices, well, we're going to shift from instructor-led training over to online training, and we need you to learn the software. We need you to learn the tools. But I think there's going to be a couple of things that we're going to see, um, and maybe it's as a result of that. I think, uh, well, first of all, I'm a big fan of the democratization of e-learning. I believe that uh, e-learning tools, developing tools, should be easy to use. That's the whole point of having computers, right? They were supposed to make our life easier. Uh, you shouldn't have to wear a white lab coat in order to be able to create e-learning, you know, and, and have a PhD attached to your name. I'm, I'm a, an accidental instructional designer, so I know exactly uh, this situation. I think stakeholders and subject matter experts can develop training, so easier to use tools will help them help more people to develop e-learning. The other trend I see is that we're probably going to be doing a lot more mobile training. So mm. right now, most of what we're building are slides, like the example that Carolyn showed that, that I had done before. Those were standard, you know, four by three slides like you would expect in PowerPoint, uh, weren't created in PowerPoint, but um, they were they were pretty fixed. So if you look at them on a mobile phone, they're still going to be this sort of shape here, this uh, rectangle shape. But in the future, we're going to see, I think, more responsive design where 
the layout of your slides shifts as it detects different size screens and devices that you view it on. Um, right now, that's been very complicated and difficult to do. And I think it's going to get easier to build that sort of training. And that's certainly what I'm looking forward to. But I think we'll see that trend in, in future uh, e-learning software as well. Yeah, so needing to be more versatile and thinking about design in terms of different ways of consuming it as well. Sure. Yeah, for sure. That's really interesting. Uh, okay, so before we get into our Q&A, I just want to provide some ways to see more of Paul's material here. Did I, I scared, shared my screen? Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, not that. I meant to make this a slideshow so we can see a little better. Um, if you have questions about Well Said Labs and our AI voices, you can always contact me, Caroline, at wellsaidlabs.com or visit our website, wellsaidlabs.com. But to see more of Paul's material, Paul, would you like to talk a little bit about your YouTube channel and your website and where to go for what? Sure. So, um, you know, I started off the YouTube channel, uh, you know, just as a way to get work, but it ended up being an opportunity for people looking to reach out to me and learn about Adobe Captivate. You can go to youtube.com slash Paul Wilson learning, all one word. And that will bring you to uh, my channel. And I appreciate everyone subscribing when you get there. Uh, the advantage of subscribing, of course, is you'll get notified when I release new videos about once a week. Uh, I don't make that promise anymore because obviously sometimes I get busy. Uh, but you'll see a choice of about 500 or so videos that you could watch about Adobe Captivate. Also, too, uh, if you're interested in hiring me, if you're one of those people that has been told by your manager, hey, we want you to bone up on this, uh, this e-learning software, Adobe Captivate, uh, you can hire me for one-on-one -on -one training. And it's based on your needs and not by some fixed or set curriculum. I can teach you what you need to know to get started. Uh, and you can visit my website at captivateteacher.com. Wonderful. Um, and then before we get started, I want to offer a special offer to our webinar registrants today. We're offering 15% off an annual Teams account that does have to be booked in February, though. So we got like just over a week if you want to contact our sales team at sales at wellsaidlabs.com. Just tell them that you attended the webinar and that you're interested in this Teams offer and we will get you hooked up there. All right, I'm gonna move over to our Q&A because I know that this crowd has a lot of questions for you, Paul. Are you ready to get into some nitty gritty? I am, yeah. Wonderful, okay. I can't see the Q&A when I'm over there in this slide share, so. <laughs> All right, um, my first one is, what is the best way to share content with SMEs who do not have Captivate? Oh, um, that's an easy one. I used to go through this very complicated process of setting up um, an account over at Amazon Web Services and building a web server and uploading my content there and sending them links. What I use today is a, a tool called Review My eLearning. Uh, full disclosure, they have endorsed some of my videos in the past. I should say that up front. Um, but they're a fantastic, uh, fantastic tool. You can upload a single video or sorry, single e-learning course to uh, their tool for free. But if you have multiple e-learning courses that you wish to share with your reviewers and stakeholders, uh, you know, you, you sign up for a, a plan with them. But it's a really great solution. It's essentially an LMS for reviewers. And I think my favorite aspect of it is that there's basically a notes panel beside every single slide. I don't know about you guys, if you've sent e-learning off and you'll, you'll get an email back from the reviewer saying, oh, there's a spelling mistake. Um, you spelled this word wrong. And you're like, where? Where did I spell it wrong? What slide number? Oh, you don't know? So you got to hunt through an entire e-learning course to find those corrections that you need to make. 
Review My eLearning puts that note right by your slide and you can check it out and you know exactly what the issue is. So it's a, a really great tool. Uh, other thing about it too, that's really kind of nice is other reviewers will see what other people wrote. So you don't get, you know, 20 people telling you the same thing over and over again. You just see it once. Uh, and then of course, you know, to fix that, that one time. So it's really a great tool for managing feedback on e-learning. Sounds like it would save a lot of time and frustration <laughs> too. For... Absolutely. Okay, I have another question here. Do you recommend doodles as well? I don't know what any of these tools are, so I'm so intrigued to hear your um, answer. So I, do, I don't know doodles, but I suspect it's probably one of those um, like screen illustration video creation tools. Uh, I used one, uh, we were actually talking about it before. Um, it's I think it was called Video Scribe. So, the idea that as the narrator is speaking, it's almost like a, a sketch artist is drawing what's being described. So my, I, I'm not sure, but I think that's what maybe that tool is. There's several of them on the market. The only thing about those is, that, you know, like anything, um, those were popular about five years ago. You saw them a lot in e-learning. Uh, you saw them in marketing videos and all that sort of thing everything kind of gets old after a while. So I, I always like to try something different, something new. It's been a while since I've done the, uh, you know, the screen sketches or whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, maybe they'll become popular again. Uh, they could be a little difficult to work with, but, uh, but you know, anything that adds excitement and interest, um, you know, is, is a great, great tool to take advantage of. Wonderful. Okay, I've seen two questions now about if you know anything about the charms update or project charm with Captivate. Uh, so, um, hmm, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things that um, I'm really not at liberty to speak about right now. Ooh. <laughs> so we all know, yeah. So Adobe Captivate 2019 came out in actually August of 2018. So it's getting very long in the tooth right now. Uh, we were shown a demo of what Project Charm, that's what they're calling it right now, which is the next version of Adobe Captivate. Um, we were shown that at the, um, the conference in September that Adobe held. So we saw a sneak peek of what was coming. Um, what I can tell you is that if you signed up for the beta for that, uh, you may see an invitation really soon to participate in that. You'll get a chance to download um, a version of it. It's very early stages right now. And of course, have an opportunity to give Adobe feedback and let them know what you think is working well and what would be better if it was this way or that way. But it's uh, it's definitely happening. For everyone who says that it's not happening, I can say it's definitely happening. So take that as you will. <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> Very exciting. Uh, okay, someone is asking, where did you get the avatar characters in the example that we shared, those people? Oh, those really kind of flat uh, cartoon characters. Uh, so those I found, and this was um, this was a very clever solution for me. I didn't want to have to buy multiple images. So I found um, a stock image, and that one was on Adobe Stock. So stock.adobe.com, I think. That was... Um, that was an image that included about a dozen of these characters. So I was able to crop it in such a way that I ended up with 12 photos without having to buy 12 images. So um, yeah, but check for, um, actually that, that might lead to a, an interesting point that I should emphasize. If there's something I can't answer for you today, uh, but if, if you have that question, if that's your question, uh, go over to my YouTube channel, pick any video and explain what you're looking for. And I might be able to give you even the, the item number, the resource number, so you could find that same image and purchase that from Adobe Stock if you wish. Adobe Stock is Adobe's version of 
Shutterstock or iStock or, or you know, Getty images and that sort of thing. And, you know, they're, um, they're a good choice, but, you know, I've also used um, in the past, uh, let me just give a, an alternative to that because we definitely want to point out that it's, uh, gosh, what is it now? I'm drawing a blank. I'll think of it. Let's keep going and I'll think about it. And I'll get back to you on that. Great. And we'll be sure and provide a link to your YouTube videos so people can find those easily to put a comment in there. Um, all right, let's see. Is there an easy way to create entrance animations, not just emphasis and exit, in a state view in Captivate? That's a very specific one there. Mm. Um, I don't really play around with states when it comes to animation because, of course, states usually require something you to something that you trigger. You can trigger uh, changing of states um, through advanced actions. So you could write a little advanced action that says, you know, uh, change. You know, uh, for those that don't know, Captivate supports something called multi-state objects. So I could take a picture of, um, you know, a good example could be, I could take a picture of my, um, my AirPods case. And then I could have another state where it shows the top open. And then I could have another version. It's all within the same image, uh, almost like an animated GIF in many ways with the AirPods actually coming out of the case. And what you could do is you could actually run a little advanced action on enter of the slide that the first thing it does is it opens the case and then you can delay the next action by X number of seconds and then have it pop up with the case open and do all kinds of neat stuff like that. But generally I do timeline stuff. So like if I know that I wanna have a little bit of movement and animation and especially on something like a title slide, I'll use the, uh, the timing panel in Captivate to apply different motion effects and uh, emphasis effects. And you can do some really cool stuff. Uh, if you go to uh, my YouTube channel and just do a search for Adobe Captivate effects, there's a really cool video where I simulate um, a little clip of a Star Wars movie where a, TIE fighter seems to appear to be flying in. I'm using multiple effects to create that. Uh, and it, it looks very 3D and very cool. But again, just one of many hundreds of <laughs> videos that you can get from my YouTube channel. Oh, fun. Yeah, got to be sure to get over there. Uh, let's see. When, you, when your work is completed with a client and you have to deliver the whole product, how do you handle purchased stock imagery that is then bundled with the delivered package? Is there any copyright concerns when you're not using those open source images? Um, well, open source, you don't have to really worry about it. But when I create like an end product for my client based on uh, stock photography uh, that I've purchased or if I subscribe to it, uh, typically the stock photography sites will have like a blanket document that can, you know, you can use if, if there becomes a legal issue. Usually there isn't. Um, I'd say the best thing, my best advice would be um, just to keep a record of that stuff. So when I purchase, um, you know, I create folders on my, uh, my cloud server uh, for all my clients. And within those folders are not only the source files that I would have included in any e-learning courses that I developed for them, but also, um, you know, any paperwork, documentations, purchase orders, things like that. I keep a very good record. Um, you know, I learned very early in my career, uh, you know, when someone attempted to come back to me and you know, this was an internal customer. It was, oh, you said you were gonna do this. And I was able to produce the email. It's, no, actually, here's exactly what we agreed upon. Here was the scope of the project. And you know, here's what I said I was going to do for you. And then there was, you, know, you can't argue with an email from them stating exactly what it was that you're gonna do. So the same thing would apply to purchased resources too, any kind of multimedia that you've purchased. I don't think you need to hand that over to the client, 
Um, the, the reality too is like as a freelancer though, I do have, uh, you know, business insurance as well. Uh, you know, if something was to happen, like if I'm teaching someone uh, or if I'm, I'm building a course on safety and there's something that turns out to be inaccurate in my, my e-learning course that results in maybe someone being hurt, God forbid that's never happened to me. But, you know, I take the appropriate precautions as a freelancer, make sure I've got, you know, the liability insurance for such, such situations. So. Makes sense. Uh, here's a good kind of general one. What do you use for your storyboarding? Actually, I just use Microsoft Word. Um, I've tried a few other things over the years. And uh, I might even be able to find um, a video that actually I used as the basis of the the, the template that I use. Let me just do a quick storyboard. Template. I've changed it from what the original creator of this video did. If I can find it, I'll pop the link to the video. And uh, I'll see if I can find it. Oh, there it is. It's actually from an organization called elearning.net. So um, I'll just pop this in the chat here. It's not exactly what I use, but it's very close. So if you wanted to check out, um, they've got an article about it and uh, it is a template. They've got a video that explains it on that link I sent. And they also, um, they have a, a way you can download um, it's a free template that anyone can use. So, but you can simply do what I did, kind of copy it and you know make it work for you. I don't use exactly the columns that they use, but for me, it's important to to build that story storyboard first. I've seen so many e-learning developers who skip that storyboard stage, and then they present a finished e-learning course to their client. And the client looks at them like, you're crazy. Uh, this is not what we were asking for at all. And of course, you've spent many hundreds of hours in some cases developing this e-learning course. Uh, doing a storyboard in Microsoft Word, or some people use Excel, some other people use PowerPoint. Um, I think what's important is that you get sign off from your stakeholder. Yes, you've, you've captured what we want to do. We've captured the, the training that we want to build uh, before you move on to putting it in Captivate and spending uh, all those hours building it out. So uh, good question, though. I think you're on mute, Carolyn. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> no problem. Uh I think we have time for one last question to finish here within sure. the hour. Uh, here's a question about, do you have any recommendations on where to find inclusive images such as people with disabilities or um, images that show all different kinds of um, people, I guess. Diversity, yeah, for sure. Yeah. The um, So one of the tools that I often use is actually built right into Adobe Captivate. Uh, Adobe has partnered with eLearning Brothers uh, to take advantage of a lot of their stock photography. So this, if, if, if you've already got Adobe Captivate, you have this uh, basically built in. So when you go to the Assets Store, and the icon for the Assets Store is right in the main toolbar of, of Adobe Captivate, and you go to the third party option, I can't remember what it's called here. Uh, let me just quickly open this up and I'll tell you exactly. In fact, if I can share my screen, uh, Carolyn, I can show everyone where I'm talking, what I'm talking about here. Yeah, let me see if I can. <laughs> I'm currently disabled from doing that, but if I can, if you can grant uh -huh. me that, I can show people Captivate and where, the, where to find it. Okay, can you try now? I think I... Perfect. Great. 
So here's Captivate. There's the asset store right up there. If I click on that and we go to characters and you're right, like at first glance, the characters that come with Adobe Captivate, it's, I would say minimal diversity here. But if you click on the discover tab, which is uh, right up here in the middle, the, the, there's three tabs on the asset store you'll see this warning message that you're being brought to a third party solution. That's okay to say, I understand. And um, once this loads, you get tons. So if I just hide the, the search here, uh, for example, I did a course uh, on accessibility and I needed an image of a person in a wheelchair. So I can literally type that and I'll get persons in wheelchairs. Um, if I'm looking for African-American, you know, uh, well, there's some cartoon characters, but if I scroll down far enough, we'll get some real life models and actors who uh, posed for these sorts of things. And, you know, I, I like it because not only are they showing us uh, what you'd expect, but, uh, you know, when you, see models, but you're getting all different uh, size people, body types, genders. Uh, there's a lot of variety here. So it's not bad. It's pretty good. Um, so if you're looking for uh, to be as inclusive as possible, you know, take advantage of the discover tab. That would, uh, that would give you the greater selection than what's built into Captivate there. Well, thank you so much for all of this advice today. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, if we didn't get to your question, go to Paul's YouTube channel, leave your question and a comment on any video because he reads all those comments and he'll get back to you as well. We shared those email addresses. I'll put those in our replay send, which I'll probably get out tomorrow. And other than that, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you everyone for joining us today and have a wonderful rest of your week. We'll see you next time. Thank you, it's been great. Great, thanks, Paul, bye.